The secret of backpacking is the balance of the burden. This airman is having trouble climbing because his pack is too far down and to one side. If your pack is giving you trouble, stop and fix it. If necessary, tear it apart and re-roll it. You should carry a pack like this. The center of balance of the burden aligned with your own center of balance. The pack's center of balance is vertically in line with the center of balance at the feet. If your pack is carried too high, the center of balance is forward of the feet and the back muscles instead of the bone structure bear the weight. If your pack is thick with too much weight too far back, it will make you strain the stomach muscles in trying to balance it forward. If the weight of your pack hangs to one side, you have to strain the leg muscles of that side and the side muscles of the other side to balance. This is a pack board. Here's a pack frame. And this is the rucksack type. The knapsack and the oriental A-frame. You may have to improvise a pack carrier and tump line. You can make them from your parachute harness and shroud line. Double width chest straps stretch from nipple to nipple. Single width shoulder straps are sewed at right angles to each end of the chest straps. The shoulder straps reach from the chest straps back to the belt line. Grommets or loops are put on the two lower corners of the front of the carrier. Pieces of shroud line about four feet long are fastened to the back ends of the shoulder straps. The tump line is a broad band with loops at each end to fit over the head with shroud lines to tie back to the burden. There are two good ways of making up bundles for use with the improvised pack carrier. The gear that you will carry must be arranged in the bundle so that it will be balanced from side to side, front to back, and when finished, be compact but not too hard. The cover of your bundle is wrapped like any package. Arrange the gear so that it will be slightly heavier at what will become the bottom of the bundle. But the final flap of the cover must wrap downward. Start tying the bundle about a fourth of its length from one end. Circle the bundle with a shroud line Loop to another point about one-fourth the length from the other end and circle the bundle again. Tie off 
and circle the bundle lengthwise and tie again. Here's how to fit the bundle onto the carrier. Fit the shoulder straps and shroud line strings around and under the bundle so that the ends of the strings can later be pulled through the loop or grommet on the front of the carrier. Tie the ends of the tump line strings to the middle or bottom edge of each end of the bundle. From the other ends of the tump line strings through the loops at the ends of the headpiece. Sit with your back to the bundle, then pull the carrier and tump line over your head. Draw the strings until they're snug and tie them off with slip knots. Now you're ready to stand up. Stand and shrug the bundle until it's comfortable on your back and adjust the strings until the pack is held firmly in place. The other type pack is the roll bundle. Place the shroud lines on each side of the cover from 8 to 14 inches from the edges. Fold the edges in to enclose these lines. Arrange your gear on the cover close to one end so the bundle will be balanced from side to side and all the hard objects enclosed in soft material. Wrap the near end of the cover over the gear. Hold the exposed end of the line and draw the string tight in the fold. Repeat this at the other side. Roll the bundle, drawing the string tight after each roll until the cover is completely wrapped around the gear and tightly drawn at each side. Now tie the strings tightly. When this is done, repeat the same thing on the other end. After you have tied both ends of the pack, take the long loose ends of the strings and make a series of cross ties the whole length of the bundle. Hold the bundle by the short strings on each end so that it rolls to its point of balance. Flatten it from front to back and recheck its balance. That finishes it. You attach it to the carrier the same as the other bundle. Proper use of these backpacking techniques for many types of burdens will conserve your energy and aid you in your travel.
to the air crewman suddenly faced with the emergency of a disabled aircraft, nothing is more important than the operation of his escape system. If all else fails, he must rely on his egress system, and it must work right the first time. This is the Martin Baker ejection seat, an escape system designed to automatically the air crewman suddenly faced with the emergency of a disabled aircraft, nothing is more important than the operation of his escape system. If all else fails, he must rely on his egress system, and it must work right the first time. This is the Martin Baker ejection seat, an escape system designed to automatically remove the air crewman from the disabled aircraft quickly and safely. Maintaining these seats in peak operating condition is up to you. You can help assure that each seat you work on will work right the first time. In order to service Martin Baker ejection seats more effectively, you should have a working knowledge of how they operate. This film will cover their principles of operation and will take you step by step through an ejection sequence. First, let's look at the major components of the Martin Baker ejection seat. The catapult gun provides the thrust required to eject the seat and its occupant from the aircraft. Tracks on the outside of the gun receive the main beam assembly, which slips down and is mounted onto the gun. The other major components fit onto this framework. A seat bucket positioning actuator located between the main beams is used to raise and lower the seat bucket height according to the needs of the occupant. The seat bucket supports the pilot and contains his survival pack. Mounted on the seat bucket are various control handles and linkages which operate the seat. The gas-powered inertia reel locks the occupant snugly in the seat during ejection or when excessive g-forces are encountered. The personnel parachute support arch is bolted to the main beam above the seat bucket. The personnel parachute is mounted here and the assembly provides a firm support for the pilot during ejection. The drogue container or headrest is mounted on the upper portion of the main beam assembly. The two drogue parachutes and the face curtain are stored in this container. On the top left side of the main beam assembly is the drogue gun. When the drogue gun is fired automatically during the ejection sequence, it deploys the drogue parachutes. On the right side of the seat is the time release mechanism. The occupant is held in the seat during ejection until the time release mechanism actuates to release him and deploy his personnel parachute. Other important components are the scissors mechanism, which retains the drogue chute to the seat until the time release mechanism actuates, allowing the scissors to open. The canopy interlock mechanism, which assures that the aircraft canopy will be jettisoned before the seat is fired. And the two identical leg restraint mechanisms, which draw in the occupant's legs and secure them during ejection. In the Mark H7 seat, additional thrust is provided by a rocket motor attached to the bottom of the seat bucket. This rocket assist gives the seat a zero-zero capability, safe ejection with the aircraft sitting stationary on the deck. A thrust angle adjustment arm, which engages a guide track on the seat main beam, maintains an optimum thrust angle for the rocket motor when the seat bucket is adjusted up or down. Normal operation of the Martin Baker seat consists of 
Controlling shoulder movement by positioning the shoulder harness manual control handle. Adjusting the leg restraint cords by pulling forward on the snubber finger rings or releasing them by pulling aft on the leg restraint manual release handle. And positioning the seat up or down by actuating the seat height adjustment switch. Emergency operation of the seat includes the events that occur during an ejection. There are three control handles provided for emergency operation. The primary control is the face curtain handle over the occupant's head. Pulling this handle initiates the automatic ejection sequence. The secondary ejection handle on the front of the seat bucket provides an alternate method of firing the seat when the primary handle cannot be reached. The guard which locks the secondary ejection handle in its receptacle should always be in the up position during ground operation. The third emergency control is the emergency harness release handle. In a ditching situation, or if automatic separation does not occur after ejection, the emergency harness release handle will release all restraints so that the occupant can push free of the seat. In general, the ejection sequence can be divided into three phases. Pre-ejection. Ejection. and post-ejection. Very briefly, here is what happens in the three phases. Pre-ejection begins when the air crewman grasps the primary control handle and pulls the face curtain over his head. If, for some reason, he can't reach the face curtain handle, the ejection sequence may also be initiated by pulling the secondary control handle between his legs. Pulling either handle will jettison the canopy reel the man in and lock him against the seat and detonate the catapult gun. This begins the ejection phase. The catapult drives the seat and its occupant up the guide rails. As they rise, the air crewman's legs are drawn in close to the seat bucket. All connections between the seat and the aircraft are broken. The electrical connection for the seat actuator is broken. The quick disconnect to the ballistic inertia reel is broken. The emergency oxygen supply is activated. The IFF switch is tripped to send out signals. And trip rods are pulled to actuate the drogue gun and the time release mechanism. Finally, as the seat leaves the guide rails, the rocket motor firing lanyard pulls the sear from the rocket motor which ignites to produce an added thrust. When the rocket motor burns out, the ejection phase is complete. Post-ejection begins almost simultaneously. The drogue gun completes its timed run and fires the piston deploying the drogue parachutes, which stabilize and decelerate the seat. When the seat is within the safe altitude range of 11,500 to 14,500 feet, the time release mechanism actuates, releasing the occupant, is personnel parachute and survival kit from the seat. It also releases the drogues which then pull the personnel parachute out of its container. The opening shock of the personnel parachute pulls the occupant out of the seat allowing him to make a normal descent. In reality the entire sequence happens very quickly. In a low altitude ejection below the 11,500 to 14,500 altitude range the time span from pulling the face curtain to complete deployment of the personnel parachute is only a few seconds. But now let's follow a Martin Baker seat ejection step by step, taking a closer look at each event that occurs during the sequence. As we have seen, the sequence begins when the air crewman pulls the face curtain handle or the secondary ejection handle between his legs. This rotates the torque tube and firing lever and the canopy interlock mechanism. It turns far enough to pull the firing pin from the seat mounted initiator and to contact the banana links. If the rotation were to continue, the banana links would pull the sear which would fire the catapult gun, but rotation is stopped at this point by the canopy interlock block. This is to assure that the seat won't eject before the canopy is jettisoned. When the firing pin is pulled from the seat-mounted initiator, however, 
it fires, instantaneously sending gas pressure throughout the emergency escape sequencing system. This causes the gas-powered inertia reel to retract the occupant's restraint harness and lock his upper torso in position for the ejection. At the same time, it causes the canopy to be jettisoned. The canopy is connected to the interlock block by a cable, and when the canopy goes, so does the block. Now, as the air crewman continues to pull on the face curtain, there is nothing to block movement of the torque tube. The firing lever pushes the banana links forward. They pull the sear, driving the firing pin into the primary cartridge, and the catapult gun is detonated. The catapult gun provides the force required to eject the seat from the aircraft. It is composed of an outer barrel with two auxiliary cartridges, an intermediate barrel, and an inner barrel with a primary cartridge breech at the top. The outer barrel is attached to the aircraft by mounting lugs, and the seat is locked to the outer barrel by the top latch mechanism on the upper left side of the main beam. The locking action is accomplished by a plunger which extends from the top latch mechanism through the safety latch in the outer barrel and seats in the breech at the top of the inner barrel. When the sear is pulled, the firing mechanism ignites the primary cartridge. Gas pressure fills the inner barrel and begins to drive it upward. As it rises the first half inch, the plunger is forced out by the chamfered portion of the breech, unlocking the seat from the outer barrel. The breech contacts the seat upper cross beam and begins to lift the seat. Further movement forces the plunger out of the safety latch in the outer barrel until it is fully disengaged and the seat is free to be driven up the rails. As the gases continue to expand in the catapult gun, the inner barrel and the intermediate barrel rise together, thrusting the seat upward and exposing, first, the lower auxiliary cartridge, which is ignited when exposed to the hot gases and provides added pressure to sustain the thrust of the catapult gun, and then the upper auxiliary cartridge, which does the same. When the two barrels reach the top of the outer barrel, the intermediate barrel is snubbed to a stop by 12 gas-filled rings and a carrier ring, which compress between a piston at the bottom of the intermediate barrel and a top guide bushing on the outer barrel, and the inner barrel continues upward. There are two soft rivets retaining the inner guide bushing to the top of the intermediate barrel. The inner barrel hits the bushing, shearing the rivets, and leaves the ejection gun propelling the seat out of the aircraft. But let's go back about one half second to the beginning of the ejection. As the seat moves up the guide rails, several things happen automatically. The occupant's legs are pulled back against the seat. The line to the gas-powered inertia reel is pulled from a quick disconnect coupling. The electrical connection to the seat actuator is broken. The lower block of the composite disconnect is pulled from the survival kit. A trip rod pulls the sear from the drogue gun and the escapement mechanism starts to run. Another trip rod pulls the sear from the time release mechanism, which assumes a ready condition. The IFF switch is tripped. And finally, as the seat leaves the guide rails, a lanyard from the aircraft deck to the rocket motor becomes taut and pulls the sear from a firing mechanism in the rocket motor. This detonates an initiating cartridge, which produces the necessary heat and pressure to ignite the solid propellant which burns for approximately 22 hundredths of a second, propelling the seat well clear of the aircraft. At about the same time that the rocket motor burns out and the seat reaches its maximum altitude, the drogue gun completes its three-quarter second time delay, fires, and propels the drogue piston out of the barrel. The piston pulls the drogue withdrawal line, breaking the safety ties on top of the drogue container, and extracts the 22-inch controller drogue. The controller drogue, in turn, extracts the five-foot diameter stabilizer drogue, which stabilizes and decelerates the seat. As we have seen, if the ejection takes place at an altitude above 14,500 feet, the time release mechanism is in a ready condition, but will not actuate until its barostat senses that the seat has descended 
to a safe altitude. But if the ejection takes place within the 11,500 to 14,500 foot altitude range, the timing mechanism begins to run immediately. In any case, from the moment the time release mechanism begins its timed run, approximately two and one quarter seconds later, the rack plunger becomes fully extended and the shackle release plunger is released to contact the harness release lever. This frees the occupant from the seat by releasing his leg restraint cords, his restraint harness, and parachute restraint straps. Simultaneously, the scissors will be opened. Up to this point, the drogue chutes have been fastened to the top of the seat by the drogue shackle, which has been clamped in the scissors. Now, the drogue shackle is released and the drogues are free of the seat. The drogue parachutes pull the link line which extracts the pins holding the face curtain restraint straps and the parachute restraint straps. The face curtain pulls away and springs and the personnel parachute support push the personnel parachute forward. The drogues continue to pull the link line forcing open the guillotine trap door and putting tension on the personnel parachute withdrawal line which in turn deploys the personnel parachute. The occupant is held to the seat only by sticker clips until the opening shock of the parachute pulls him free to complete his normal descent. If the time release mechanism should fail to operate, the occupant can manually free himself from the seat by pulling the emergency harness release handle. Through mechanical linkage, pulling this handle releases the occupant from attaching points on the seat, leg restraint cords, lap belt, shoulder harness, and personnel parachute restraint straps. It also frees his personnel parachute from the drogues and the ejection seat by means of the guillotine assembly. Pulling the emergency harness release handle extracts the sear from the firing pin and the guillotine firing mechanism. The firing pin ignites the cartridge, generating gas pressure in the line to the guillotine piston, which drives the guillotine blade to sever the personnel parachute withdrawal line. The occupant can now pull the parachute from the support arch, push free of the sticker clips, and clear of the seat. Pulling his D-ring deploys the parachute, and he makes a normal descent. In the F-4 Phantom, where there are two crew members, ejection may be either single or dual. Provisions have been made for either man to initiate the ejection and for proper sequencing. This is accomplished by the Emergency Escape Sequencing System. The Emergency Escape Sequencing System is composed of pyrotechnic initiators, valves, lines, and hoses, which interconnect the various seat and canopy components in the two cockpits, which function during ejection. This system provides fast, sequenced ejection of the canopies and ejection seats during emergency escape of both crew members. Dual ejection may be initiated by either man through the use of a time delay initiator and time delay actuators in the system. The dual ejection sequence is always aft canopy, aft seat, forward canopy, forward seat. Whenever an ejection is initiated from the forward cockpit, it is always a dual ejection unless the aft crew member has already ejected. The aft crew member can initiate either a single ejection, where only he leaves the aircraft, or a dual ejection, in which the sequencing system ejects both men. The selection is made at the eject command selective valve, located above the instrument panel in the aft cockpit. If the aft crewman initiates an ejection with the handle in the normal closed position, only he will be ejected. If the pilot becomes disabled, however, the aft crew member can grasp the handle, pull it out approximately one inch, and turn it clockwise 90 degrees. This opens the valve so that when the aft crewman initiates the ejection, both men will be ejected. Regardless of the position of the eject command selector valve, an ejection initiated from the front cockpit will always be a dual ejection. Here is the sequence of events in an ejection initiated from the forward cockpit. The pilot pulls either the face curtain handle or the secondary ejection handle. 
Either one fires the forward seat mounted initiator. Gas pressure from the initiator is routed through the sequencing system to the aft cockpit equipment storage mechanism. The forward inertia reel which locks the man in the forward seat. And to a time delay initiator which briefly delays ejection of the forward seat long enough for the aft seat to leave the aircraft. At the same time, gas flows to the sequence actuator for the aft seat, which undergoes a brief time delay. To the aft seat inertia reel, which locks the man in the aft seat. And to the aft canopy emergency system. The aft canopy is jettisoned. The aft sequence actuator burns through, detonates the aft catapult gun, and the seat ejects. Next, the time delay initiator, which has been burning in the forward cockpit, burns through, sending gas to the forward sequence actuator and to the forward canopy emergency system. The forward canopy is jettisoned. The sequence actuator fires the catapult gun and the forward seat is ejected. A dual ejection initiated from the aft cockpit is almost exactly the same except that the aft crew member must open the eject command selector valve. The sequence of events in a dual ejection initiated from the aft cockpit begins when the aft crew member, having opened the eject command selector valve, pulls either the face curtain handle or the secondary ejection handle. This fires the aft seat mounted initiator routing gas pressure through the sequencing system to the aft inertia reel the aft canopy emergency system, the aft cockpit equipment storage system. Since the eject command selector valve is open, gas pressure enters the forward cockpit, operating the inertia reel and actuating a time delay initiator. At the same time, it goes to the aft sequence actuator, which after a brief time delay, initiates ejection of the aft seat. As the aft seat leaves the aircraft, the time delay initiator in the forward cockpit burns through, actuating the forward canopy emergency system and the forward sequence actuator. The only other mode of ejection is the aft seat only, which is accomplished with the selector valve in the normal or closed position and is identical to the aft-initiated dual ejection, except that the gas pressure cannot reach the forward portion of the sequencing system because the valve is closed. The Martin Baker ejection seat provides the naval airmen with the best available means for fast, safe emergency escape from a disabled aircraft. But the operation of each seat you work on will depend upon how well you do your job. This film has shown the basic principles of how the seat operates. It's up to you to continue to study the Martin Baker seat in detail and to learn how to maintain it properly so that if and when an air crewman has to pull the face curtain, the seat will work right the first time. next few minutes, I want to talk about something that is more or less on everybody's mind these days. Space travel. I'm not going to try to predict just when we'll be flying through space, but I will say that one of our problems in setting up a definite timetable for manned space flight is adequate guidance and control. As flying has progressed from conventional prop aircraft to the latest jets, and on down to long-range missiles, 
We've had to continually lick guidance problems. What we've accomplished up till now is only a beginning for what we'll need to achieve to master true space flight with manned vehicles. Using a craft like this, we're inviting you to join us on a simulated flight from Earth to orbit. Along the way, we'll point out the fundamental problems of guidance and control. With a few, and only a few, of the many possible solutions. Our objective, or target, will be this space station. For our purposes, we're assuming that it's already traveling around the Earth in circular orbit, which is, as you know, a specialized type of orbit, but the most desirable for a space station. Here's our craft with its crew ready for takeoff. Departure must be made at the right time for that space station traveling at about five miles per second can't vary its velocity to suit the navigational whims of a vehicle coming from Earth. With everything ready, our pilot starts the stabilized platform gyros. And the platform begins to position itself with reference to the vertical. After the gyros attain the proper rotation speed, they'll hold the platform in the same attitude with respect to space. This platform will also have to be referenced to a precise direction so the guidance system can position our vehicle on the desired trajectory. This exact direction is determined by an optical device located in an accurately surveyed position. Automatically, the platform rotates until it's properly aligned and the accelerometers are in position to provide accurate acceleration information to the guidance system. Speaking of these accelerometers, let's identify them. This one detects vertical acceleration. This one, lateral. And this one, longitudinal. Here's how they work. All accelerometers function on the principle of inertia. That is, a body tends to resist a change in motion. Therefore, when the instrument is accelerated, inertia tends to retard the mass, causing one spring to extend and the other to compress, displacing the pointer. The amount of displacement is proportional to the acceleration encountered. This information is fed to the guidance system as one of its inputs. When acceleration ceases and the velocity is constant, the pointer returns to the zero position. Note that during deceleration, the pointer moves in the opposite direction. And at full stop, the pointer is again at zero. When the gyros and accelerometers are all set, the booster engine is started and our ship lifts off. Note that the takeoff is vertical. This solves an important problem, getting the vehicle out of the densest portion of the atmosphere as quickly as possible, thus reducing atmospheric drag and heating effects. From the moment of launch, the gyros begin functioning as an autopilot. Let's see how it works. Suppose the vehicle strays slightly off path. Immediately, the autopilot sends an error signal to the servo controls. This mechanism supplies power to properly position the gimbaled booster engine, thus correcting the error. The autopilot also has another function, controlling the vehicle so that at a preset time, it rolls out toward the program trajectory. After the rollout is completed, the booster engine burns out and separates. At this stage, the active guidance system takes control of the vehicle. The heart of this system is the accelerometers, already explained. Actually, of course, the accelerometers have been functioning all the time. But up to this point, they have let the autopilot run the ship, and their computer has sent no correction signals to the servo controls. But from the moment of booster burnout, the computer goes into action. Computers are sensitively designed instruments capable of performing complicated operations quickly and accurately and of retaining the required input data. 
their memory system must be almost superhuman in permitting them to recall at all times just what operations they need to perform under given circumstances. Let's take a specific example. As our vehicle proceeds, the accelerometers feed acceleration data to the first integrator, which applies time to acceleration. This operation provides velocity as an output. These data are sent as inputs to the computer and to a second integrator, whose output is distance. This information also goes to the computer as a second input. From these inputs, the computer calculates the required data, trajectory and velocity, comparing the actual results of the moment with the desired results, which have been programmed into the computer. Any differences are sent as error signals to the servo controls. These controls now perform the needed functions to return our vehicle to the desired trajectory. When the craft achieves this trajectory, plus the desired velocity, the main rocket engine is cut off, but does not separate, for we'll need it later. Now the autopilot assumes another function, controlling stabilization by means of reaction motors, one on each wing for roll control one on each side of the nose for yaw control, and one above and below the nose for pitch control. Velocity alone keeps our vehicle traveling through its mid-course phase, an elliptical orbit inside the circular orbit of the space station. Radar contact is made with the station, getting an accurate distance and direction. We also need an accurate relative velocity determination. So by combining Doppler radio with the radar, we get all three values. These fed to the computer determine the amount and direction of thrust needed to accelerate the vehicle so that its orbit's apogee will coincide in space and time with the orbit of the space station. As this coincidence occurs, the correct velocity must be attained to keep our vehicle in the circular orbit. Here, for the first time during flight, human judgment is needed. The pilot applies small amounts of accurately controlled thrust in this highly critical area to provide terminal guidance for mooring our vehicle to the space station. The crafts join, and our present objective is accomplished. Launching a manned vehicle to meet a space station in circular orbit. We hope we've made you aware of some of the guidance and control problems that'll be met in these three phases of space travel. The initial, the mid-course, and the terminal. We can't emphasize too strongly that here we've oversimplified the problems for clarity. But these concepts are sound and can be applied to any type of system that may be developed. And the solutions we've offered aren't the only ones. Perhaps they'll stimulate you to think of some better ones, for we've all got to work together in solving these problems of space flight, which could be the next exciting step in the process of human progress.